Next, we have our main event, uh, our keynote address from the 2020 Falona Family Interdisciplinary Science Award winner, who is Dr. Patricia Corcoran. Dr. Corcoran is a professor and chair of the Earth Sciences Department at Western University. Her research focuses on natural and anthropogenic sedimentary deposits with the aim of gaining an understanding and of Earth's changing surface and atmospheric conditions through time. And right now, she worries about the distribution, accumulation, and degradation of plastic debris in our sediment, our water, and our aquatic animal populations. Dr. Corcoran's research has been featured in numerous media outlets, including National Geographic Magazine, The Huffington Post, Science Magazine, and The New York Times. Her work on microplastic pollution involves interdisciplinary collaborations with academics from chemistry, biology, engineering, statistics, mathematics, visual arts, and across the humanities. Surely a tour de force in interdisciplinarity. Her keynote address today is entitled Plastic Entanglements, an Interdisciplinary Approach to Plastic Pollution Research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Corcoran. Over to you, Patricia. Thanks, Paul. That was a wonderful introduction. And I'm really happy to know that I'm not going to be judged on this. Um, I would first of all like to say that uh, I'm very honored to have received this prize, um, the Falona Interdisciplinary Science Prize. And I'd like to thank James and Mary Catherine Falona for actually allowing uh, Western to have the honor of awarding this prize to someone um, every year. And so to start, uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm going to talk about plastic entanglements and I'm just going to start by saying a couple of things. Um, I've had people ask how, how I ended up being interested in working with people from many different disciplines. And I think one of the answers is that I, I sort, of, sort of grew up with a brain like that. Um, I remember that when I was very young in grade three and four, I always, I said to myself, I wanted to be a geologist, which is what I ended up being, but it was sort of a, a, a different kind of route that I took. I remember when I was very small and I lived in a small mining town and we didn't have paved driveways. We had uh, little pebbles basically. And I used to play out in those pebbles, trying to figure out what those different little rocks were made of. But I hit high school and I discovered that I also loved English. I loved uh, writing uh, poetry and short stories. And I also loved art. So English and art took center stage throughout high school. Uh, but I always had this, this interest in the outdoors and in rocks. And by the time I got to university, I realized that, you no, know, I want to go back to being a geologist. And I tried to figure out how to meld all of those together and, and really I think in some ways, the career that I have now as a professor allows me to um, sort of tie all of those things together. So not just science, but also art in that we're often drawing a lot of the structures in the rocks, but also the English part, except when I'm writing scientifically, it doesn't sound as pretty as, as someone who's actually in the humanities. So um, let's go to the next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through this very short outline. Um, you're going to see a video that summarizes briefly the origins and outcomes of the work I started doing with uh, visual arts colleagues. But the actual work for plastic pollution began with a chemist who is the director of Surface Science Western, Mark Giesinger. And uh, he and I noticed uh, a lot of plastic debris along the shorelines on the island of Hawaii. And from there, the idea sort of blossomed as to what we could do, what we could do with respect to plastic pollution. What was that plastic doing on the beach in Hawaii? And why didn't we see that plastic everywhere else at the time? So that was many years ago. I think that was in about 2008. So I've been since working on the idea of plastic pollution. Um, the, after the video, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about plastic glomerate in the media. You may not know what that means right now, but I will get to that. That's going to be followed by the collaborative process. And then a little snippet of science. I had struggled with whether I would talk about 
every scientific thing I've done. And then I realized that it would be a lot more fun if I talked, if I, if I sort of gave a story instead. So I'm going to go with the story, but I do have to include a little bit of science because this is an interdisciplinary science prize. And then um, we're going to talk about main outcomes of that work and some recommendations for interdisciplinary research. Next slide. And I'm just putting this up here because I'm not going to show it again for anyone who has not ever seen photos like this. Uh, this is the reason that we, we research plastic pollution. Uh, plastic, as you all probably know by now, is quite harmful to the environment and ecosystems and to certain organisms. So here you can see um, a seabird with its stomach full of plastic debris. You can see a turtle that mistook a plastic bag um, for a jellyfish. Um, you can see the seal that's entangled in a fishing net or a ghost net. Uh, dogfish, uh, spiny dogfish sharks that are entangled in a ghost net. And then that ball or the buoy that you see is actually carrying invasive species. Um, the buoy itself was from, uh, the, from Japan, but they found it on one of the Hawaiian islands. And the mussels that are attached to the buoy are actually invasive species for that region. Next slide. A lot of what my lab does and a lot of what we do with our collaborators is study what are known as microplastics. And microplastics are plastic particles that are less than five millimeters in their longest diameter. And here are just some sizes, uh, some examples of those. So in the upper left, you see what we call plastic fragments. In the upper right are plastic fibers. And in the lower part, those are microbeads. And so microplastics are can also be considered even more harmful to the environment and to organisms because the smallest organisms on the food chain can ingest these tiny microplastic particles. Um, those microplastic particles have been proven to affect reproduction, um, time of life, or uh, even the ability to move. And so if you are harming the smallest organisms on the food chain, then eventually you're harming all of the other uh, animals that feed upon those smaller ones. So it works its way up through the food chain. All right, so um, in the next slide, what we're going to do is turn this little video on. And it's actually um, something that was done by um, the Southern California Institute of Architecture. So it's very interesting that the work in science that we do has become um, tangled or entangled with art. And the video, it, it basically explains how I started working with artists in a much better way than I could tell you from just sitting here at my desk. So could we get that video going, please? I mean, the breadth of the use of this material, like we need plastic for the internet. We need it for our computers, for cars, clothing, toys. It is a material that's absolutely entwined with every facet of living today. And yet we know that it uh, is a problem in the environment and we know that it's toxic to produce. So there's these kind of two ends, both in the making of plastics and in the disposal of plastics that are really dangerous for uh, ecosystems on the planet. Hi, I'm Kelly Jazvac. I'm an artist and a professor in sculpture at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I'm Patricia Corcoran. I'm a professor at the University of Western Ontario in the Department of Earth Sciences. I'm a sedimentary petrologist, and that means I basically study sedimentary deposits in order to gain an understanding of past climates or past anthropogenic activity. So not only do I look at natural grains of sediment, I also study anthropogenic grains like plastic. My research interests involve the history of plastics, both in sculpture and contemporary art, but also in terms of the environment. And I'm really interested in what art roles could be in discussing issues like climate crisis and environmental pollution. Plastic is the name given to a group of synthetic or semi-synthetic materials that are actually created from natural products like coal, natural gas, and oil. And plastics are considered polymers. And what that basically means is that they're repeating units in a chain 
of monomers. Polymers are difficult to break down because the, the repeating units make them very durable chemically. Because they have such a long life cycle, it tends to make plastic persistent in the environment. One of the first types of plastic was actually made as part of a competition to come up with a material to replace billiard balls. And so if you can imagine how durable a billiard ball is, uh, what the design to be that replacement material must be. Production really started to ramp up around World War II. So there was all sorts of war-based reasons, for example, uh, access to rubber or things like even pantyhose, silk. Uh, pantyhose was replaced, so there was a race to invent nylon or something that could replace the silk. After World War II had ended, there was this new consumer economy that suddenly could benefit off all the, the thousands and thousands of products that can be made with materials like plastics. I had invited Charles Moore to give a public presentation. Kelly heard about this talk and came to the presentation. So after the talk, I sought out the person who organized the talk just to say, hey, I'm really interested in plastic pollution as well, in case you want to collaborate. And that person was Patricia, and she was extremely open and friendly right from the get-go. Charlie had shown a slide of this material that he had found on the big island of Hawaii, and he didn't know what to call this material, but it looked like it was composed of sediment, but it was also composed of some organic material and it was also composed of plastic and so uh, he said during the talk i've been trying to get a geologist to come out to the island and, and have a look at this and i i said me i'm a geologist and i would love to go and look at this material and so when kelly had sought me out and she said i will go to hawaii with you part of what i did with this material that i knew i would find on the beach was we had to measure them. We had to measure the length and width. We had to document them. We had to photograph them. We had to collect them. We had to actually take coordinates like latitude and longitude where each fragment was found on the beach. Uh, we had to make observations. It was so visual. Like it was, it was, I felt immediately like, oh, okay, I know how to do this. Like just looking for something really specific and describing it visually. I definitely knew that this was going to be something that we could write about and we could publish about. It shifted. So first we thought, oh, it's a story of how and this was what Charlie proposed. It was a story of how Mother Earth takes care of its own issues by um, melting this plastic from actual natural volcanic eruption. And it changed. And Kelly said something to me when we were driving. She said, what can we say about the Anthropocene? And I thought, geez, I had, I had never thought of that. And then we just started talking and it, and it became more of a bigger story to us than natural melting of plastic. It became humans are using the plastic. Humans are producing the plastic. Humans are consuming the plastic. Humans are throwing away the plastic. And then humans are burning the plastic. And it's all preserved in something that is so difficult to break apart now and becomes buried and it, and it becomes part of our, our stratigraphic record. There's so many benefits to being part of this group. It's difficult to just think of one. I would say working with people from another discipline and a very different discipline when I say to people, yep, I work with visual artists and I am a scientist and they think, well, what, what do you have in common? Like, what are you doing? And I think that where my work naturally leaves off, then their work begins. And that's how I thought of it in the beginning. But then it became, nope, we're enmeshed. We're, we're going to be enmeshed from the very start. If I think about a project that we just recently published about plastic pellets across all five Great Lakes, and we sampled 66 beaches. We were all trained in what we were looking for and how we were going to do it. We had a whole database of each individual pellet. And it took a long time. It took a year to actually characterize these. And and I had my students working on it and me, but, but we also had visual artists working on it. And then from that point, we got statisticians involved. And it's just, it just kind of steamrolled because there was so much that we could do. And now, you know, on the other side of it is we have the results out there. And then, then we get to this 
exhibition. The exhibition is called Plastic Heart Surface All the Way Through and it will be held at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto in fall 2021. As part of that exhibition, this research will be featured, but so will other angles into discussing this uh, issue around the Great Lakes. And so we have historical artworks, for example, made out of plastic in the region. We have some new commissions by contemporary artists who are responding to the theme and making new works. We have artists in the Synthetic Collective who are responding to the sampling experience. And then we've also commissioned a data visualizer, Sky Moret. She went through the pellet paper and considered ways to uh, represent the data in, an, in another visual way to make it understandable to audiences. Also, the goal of the whole show is to do it all as environmentally sustainably as possible. I think it's going to end up looking like quite a different show because of those sustainability decisions. I mean, I think it will be quite experimental, but it might also offer some interesting models uh, in terms of how to make exhibitions in the future. I think it's really important for artists to have a really full understanding of where their materials come from. I think making art in a time of climate crisis now requires that of us. So I feel really lucky to get to work with Patricia and her team because I'm learning so much about every phase of this material that I'm working with, both from how it's made to what happens to it when it ends up in the environment. Artists, sometimes we can be in take mode where we're just we're just looking for what we can get out of, out of something to, to further our practice. And a rule I had for myself that I had to also make sure I was in give mode a lot in this collaboration. And so there's things that I do that I feel aren't gonna be artworks in the end, and that is totally okay. The biggest way that my life has changed since I've been studying plastics pollution is that I've been engaging with communities. And through these communities and through public outreach, I've been able to actually educate people on the different things that they can do instead of you know, always having plastic as a constant presence in their lives. I think the main way that this research has influenced me is empowering me as a political citizen <laughs> to, to advocate, to vote, to inform myself, to know that, uh, yes, consumers have some responsibility, but also know that it's very convenient for industry to blame the consumer. As it stands now, recycling is not the solution. The, the amount of waste going into the environment is so high that no recycling scheme ever devised will be sufficient to fix what we're facing right now. The collaboration that we have as artists and scientists, it's not only necessary to include those two disciplines, and I think we need to also bring in social scientists and we have brought in government workers who can influence policy. It's not enough for us to do the research and publish it and, and do some outreach. We also need to um, affect change. And I think a big part of that is actually to work with government agencies and to work with the uh, plastics industry. So what I would like to say <laughs> to architects, <laughs> and this is thinking about architecture in a really broad sense, so not just like building a building, but thinking about systems and flow of people and materials in a civic space, is what an architecture of care might look like. A way to build structures that care for the inhabitants that use them. And so that is not just humans, but all facets of of creatures that might be implicated by both the materials that go into it, how they use the space. What might a longevity plan be when thinking about architecture as a, as a potential site for care? Okay, so um, the material that you were looking at in the video is what we called plastiglomerate um, because it looks like conglomerate but it is actually composed of these different fragments of rocks and sediment and seeds and pieces of wood and coral and uh, you know things like golf balls and lighters, but it's all hardened in a matrix of once molten plastic. And so um, it's, it don't, we don't like to refer to it as a rock, which is naturally occurring, but it's a stone. It's, it's something that we've actually created. And that stone can become buried because we, we actually dug away in the sand and we did find it at depth. So what happens, you know, we're wondering what happens to that material once it gets buried, will it become 
part of Earth's um, sedimentary record. And so these are just um, a few images from Camilo Beach on the big island of Hawaii. And that's where uh, all of this plastic was found. And so uh, you can see on the left, that's Kelly Jazbak, the person who was uh, speaking in the video. And um, she just grabbed whatever was close by. And we took some photographs just to give you an idea of what the beach looked like. In the middle photograph, you can see a lot of uh, fragments of plastic. Uh, we, we refer to those as confetti. They sort of look like confetti in that they're very colorful and visually appealing, if I may say that. And then the plastic glomerate itself was uh, on the cover of GSA Today. So that's Geological Society of America Today. So that is um, a geological journal, which we were hoping would reach a fair amount of people in the field of geology. But in the end, it seemed to reach um, other people who are not just earth scientists and on a sort of a global, global size level. So next slide. Yeah, and so these are just some examples of uh, plastic glomerate in the media, which completely floored Kelly and I. We, we had no idea that anyone would be this interested in what we were doing. And so, um, as Paul had mentioned earlier, examples um, are the New York Times or Science, uh, Science Magazine, Scientific American. Um, it's mentioned in two articles uh, in two different issues of National Geographic magazine. And as a little girl, I loved looking through those magazines when they were at school. I, we didn't actually have a subscription at home, but I remember thinking how great it would be if I could appear in National Geographic someday. That was kind of my end goal. And so <laughs> I feel as though that I have succeeded in that way, but um, it's just it's just because it's a, a specific topic that really needs a lot of people to be working on it together. And it's something that's very visual. And so when you talk about plastic pollution, everybody knows what you are talking about. Um, next slide. Not only did it appear you know, in, in science magazines, but it also appeared in art. And soon enough, um, Kelly and I were both getting requests from uh, artists who were, you know, asking us for samples, and we we only had so many samples, and, um, you know, they started to get this idea that they would just start creating it, which was really sad to us. We we didn't want people to start creating this material. We wanted people to become aware that this is what we're inadvertently creating, what humans are actually doing. But it's it was supposed to be a sort of a a sad story. Let's let's not let this type of thing happen. So we, we did get some some feedback that was very different than what we expected. Next slide. So from there, we decided to hold a uh, plastic pollution think tank in London, Ontario, and we decided to get uh, different points of view from different uh, disciplines, di researchers from different disciplines. So I just tried to label those on the photograph that you see. For example, we had our scientists, biologists, you may recognize a couple, uh, Kathleen Hill and uh, Beth Gillies as well. They were involved in this uh, think tank. We have a philosopher um, from the US, um, Paul Helm, who has his back to us. He's a chemist, but he also is at the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, and then we had several um, visual artists and photographers and also a geographer. And we were able to, uh, I, I don't know if you can see very well, but we have all those flip charts that are against the wall. So we would write and write and write and we'd pin these up. Um, and then what we did on the lower left, on the lower right um, photograph, that those are lab visits. So we did visit um, Kathleen Hill's lab, we visited um, Beth Gilley's lab, we visited my lab, just to give people an idea of what it is that scientists do and actually what each, each of us do, right? I, I would never have visited Kathleen or Beth's lab other than in this type of situation. So it enabled us to see the interest that we all have in this plastic pollution crisis, but how we attack it in different ways. Next slide. Um, also included in this think tank was a uh, tour of the recycling facility here in London. 
And it was quite it was quite eye opening to see what happens to the material that you put into your blue box here in London. And if some of you aren't aware, there are some things in London that are not recyclable, like plastic bags or styrofoam. Styrofoam is not recyclable. Um, don't use styrofoam. <laughs> it's very bad. Um, but you can see here, it's just kind of a snapshot of uh, we, we got a chance to walk through all of the end products, but we also got a chance to be in the room where um, people are working and they're sort of sorting through different items that are coming down this really fast belt. And um, I got a chance to try and separate them out and I just couldn't even keep up. It was like a bad comedy comedy show, really. Um, so the, it was really interesting to see the different ways in which they separate out plastics and paper and what happens to all of them. Like I learned some really uh, interesting things here also, something like if you think about um, using glass instead of plastic, um, but then there's no one that actually takes that glass. So they, the facility actually has to pay for people to take glass away um, rather than paying somebody. Uh, it's it's very complicated, but you know, when you think about, well, I think I'm going to use glass instead of plastic, that in itself creates its own type of uh, issue. So we were learning a lot of interesting things here. Next slide. And then we also went to the field. And so um, I had had a student who had uh, written his master's thesis and published a couple of papers and it was looking at plastic debris along shorelines of Lake Huron and Lake Erie. And we knew that the Sarnia area was a hot spot for plastic pellet pollution. And so I took everybody there and we all um, got down on our hands and knees and we, we were picking up pellets, like much like you saw in that video, um, just so that people could get an idea. Once you get to this beach, it's, a, it's called Baxter Beach. It's right near, it's right in Sarnia actually. But once you get to the beach, you don't even notice that there are pellets there. But if you get down on your hands and knees, you start to see that there are thousands of them. Um, and then we ended up uh, getting together and writing this paper, Embracing an Interdisciplinary Approach to Plastic Pollution Awareness and Action. We wanted to be able to tell everyone how we got to the products, how, how we were able to produce um, publications that were both art related and science related and not just you know science kind of a blanket term, but thinking in terms of science as um, earth science, environmental science, chemistry, biology, um, statistics, mathematics. Uh, and I'm not a statistician or mathematician by any stretch of the imagination. And so it was very interesting to work with people who, um, who think in a different way to, to how my brain works. Next slide. Uh, after that think tank and the publication of the first paper, uh, a bunch of us at the table here, there's a philosopher and some artists and a couple of our scientists, and we did a little retreat and we rented a, a place on Lake Huron, and we also used our famous flip charts. And uh, we spent about two hours just trying to think of what we were going to name our group. It's amazing how difficult it is to come up with names for things, but uh, we ended up coming up with the Synthetic Collective. And so uh, that's sort of the group name for a number of people who are working together collaboratively. So we're not just all earth scientists, but we are working together. And at this time, one of the, uh, the philosopher actually said, wouldn't it be really cool if we could go out and sample along all of the Great Lakes? And I thought, oh, well, that would be really cool, but that's, you have no idea how much time that's going to take. You have no idea, you know, what we have to look out for. Um, and so the idea was great. And then making it come to fruition was uh, a challenge, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. So next slide. All right, this was mentioned in the video a little bit. So uh, we decided to do this pellet study and in, if anybody knows anything about plastic in general, it tends to be very lightweight. And so it can be moved about very easily by um, surface water currents, but also by wind. And if you were to sample some beaches 
in the summer and then you were to sample the same beaches in the fall, you would end up with different uh, results because the, even the um, surface currents move in different in different ways depending on the different seasons. Also, some seasons are more stormy. Some are uh, also think about the Great Lakes and parts of the Great Lakes are often covered by ice. So you, you, so there are a lot of different parameters that you have to think of. So one of the, the ideas was that we would try to narrow the sampling down to as small amount of time as we could. So we, we got it to within two weeks because you couldn't have two people go around all of these beaches, there's 66 of them and sample um, in two weeks. It just wouldn't be possible. And so there were 14 samplers and um, usually we were in pairs. So a pair was working on Lake Ontario, a pair was working on Lake Erie. Uh, we had a pair on Michigan, a pair um, in uh, Huron. And then we had about five of us in Lake Superior just because it's so much larger. And so all, all uh, lakes were sampled, all shorelines, uh, not all shorelines, but 66 shorelines along all five Great Lakes. Next slide. This is just sort of what it looked like in different regions. Um, what we did was we strung out a tape measure. Initially, it was to be 20 meters long, and we would sample one meter uh, on either side of that um, tape measure. We did focus on the strand line, that's the high water mark, because most plastics tend to accumulate with the organic debris, and you can see that in the middle photo. Uh, the first people to sample were Kelly, uh, Jazback, and um, I think it was Tegan Moore, and they were on uh, Lake Huron, and they started at Sarnia. And, and they, I remember them calling me one afternoon and saying, we've been out here sampling for four hours and we've only moved five meters. So we decided to change it to 20, 20 meters down to 10 meters so that we could get these results that we needed in time. Next slide. Um, processing, so field work was actually the quickest and the processing took us more than a year. And that's just because we had over 13,000 pellets and we were characterizing each pellet manually. And so we had to measure each pellet. We took note of the different surface markings. So some pellets have two lines on them. Some have one, some have a dimple. Um, we also took note of the shape. So you, from those images, you can see some are cylinders, some are uh, spherical, and some are what we call oblate. Those are the flat ones that look like Smarties. Uh, we also characterized them according to color. So you see a whole bunch of black, pellets that are um, all, uh, all, all the same color. And then in D, you can see that some of those pellets have been weathered. So usually um, UV radiation is the main weathering agent for plastics. And so we know that these had been exposed to sunlight for quite uh, a, a good amount of time. And so what we did was we built this database and the, the database was for me anyway, enormous. For statisticians, it's probably not in the slightest bit <laughs> enormous. But at this point, it's when we decided we really have to get statisticians involved. And so um, we started working with um, Doug Wolford and Simon Bonner here at Western and uh, their uh, student, Johanna, who was amazing and has continued to be amazing in actually helping us uh, do the statistical parts of the different uh, manuscripts that we've submitted for publication. Next slide. So these are just some of the results and notice how I put statisticians with a with a, an exclamation mark and I noticed that one of our three uh, student speakers also did the same. <laughs> I think we're all we're all amazed by what statisticians can do. And so these are just some of the images that have come up. So in the in the on the left hand side, you'll notice that there were three beaches that had the most pellets. So that just shows you a, um, the bar graphs, the highest bar graphs mean that those were the greatest number of pellets. But when we took those three outlier beaches away, then you end up with what you see uh, in the inset. And so that we were able to see by coloring the bars according to the lakes, uh, which of the lakes contained the most pellets, for example, or the the sediment along the shorelines. And then another example on the right is color. So 
uh, again, the same colors for the different lakes. You can see that, for example, in, in B, that Lake Ontario contains the largest variety of colors. And that really helps us out because the more different the pellets are, then, then you know that it can be a result of the actual manufacturers or number of manufacturers. And, and Lake Ontario, as you know, in the Toronto region, um, has a very high population density, but it also has a, um, a high density of pellet manufacturers or um, industry that uses pellets to make larger plastic products. So if some of you aren't aware, pellets are just the raw products of uh, what happens is that they're shipped by rail car or by truck, and then they're brought to another facility where they're melted down and molded into the products that you, you, you use every day, like a ketchup bottle for example. Next slide. Um, so here are just other examples. The distinguishing traits are what you would find on the surface. So you can see here that the most common distinguishing trait were dimples. Uh, we also looked at the grain size of the beach relative to the number of pellets found. So you can see that the finer grain, uh, medium sand, fine sand, very fine sand tended to contain more pellets than the coarser grain beaches or the very fine grain beaches, for example, uh, composed of silt. Next slide. And really, like this is just a great snapshot. It's got a lot of information on it, but I guess I want to direct your attention to the three big yellow dots. And so one of them is in Lake Ontario. That was at Bronte Beach near Oakville. And the other is down near Sarnia. If you know anything about Sarnia, it's um, it's also called known as Chemical Valley. It's where many of the manufacturers of pellets are actually located. And then there's a big dot at the northern part of Lake Superior. And that's an odd one because if you're looking at the population density, which is shown in the gray and white to dark gray colors, there isn't a lot of population there. Not that population actually use pellets, but there are also aren't very many industries. So the industries are shown by those little tiny um, green triangles. Um, what happened on Lake Superior was back in about 2014 or 2012, I believe, there was a rail car spill of pellets and the pellets entered the lake and now they're just circulating. Those, those yellow dots along Lake Superior are all containing pellets from the same spill. And the residence time of water in Lake Superior is about 190 years. So those pellets could just be uh, recirculating throughout that lake for, for a century. And every now and then they wash up onto the beaches if you have some kind of a high wind event or a storm event. And so these are continually polluting the environment. And yes, fish uh, have been shown to ingest pellets. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then you might have heard Kelly talk about the exhibition, uh, Plastic Heart Surface All the Way Through. This has already occurred at the University of Toronto Museum, um, but it is now moving on to Paris. And so either later this year or early next year, uh, there, the exhibition will be located there. And so uh, it, it's kind of like a beginning with something very simple, and then you end up with something that's reaching global levels. And so it could only have happened with a collaboration of scientists and artists working together. Next slide. This is just an image. Uh, Kelly was talking about Sky Moret, who's a data, data visualist. And so you saw the map of the Great Lakes that occurred that that is in the scientific publication, but this is what you would find if you went to the exhibit. And so what Sky did was she used these pegs and the, the more that the peg sticks out of the wall means that there were more pellets that were located in, in those particular areas. So it's another way of visualizing the data where public can potentially better understand the distribution of these pellets. Next slide. Uh, here are just some other um, some some other artworks that are actually part of that exhibition. Um, Kelly is a photographer. That's on the left. Sarah Balance is an earth scientist, um, and then Kelly Jazback, Tegan Moore are both visual artists. 
And then Kirsty Robertson from Western and Tegan Moore also uh, made this incredible, um, I don't even know, a poster of all of the known plastic producers in the Great Lakes region. So uh, some really cool stuff that ended up coming from this um, collaboration. Next slide. Okay, some other main outcomes, just to let you know, uh, we have been lucky enough to receive funding from granting agencies like SHRC and NSERC, Northern Contaminants Program. Um, uh, when I started my interest in plastic pollution, there weren't many people that were actually studying it. And I had proposed a program to the NSERC Discovery Program and, and I didn't get the funding. And I didn't get the funding for many, many years. And then finally the funding came through when um, plastic pollution was actually more appearing more in the, in the media or you know, in the general public. So um, that's really helped. But in the beginning, what helped me was the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks were actually the people who kept giving me grants because they realized how important this type of work really is. And so we have published uh, several scientific papers, uh, as well as many artistic books, um, magazine articles. We have presented at museums. I've been invited to co-present with artists, uh, many scientific uh, presentations. And also, I'm really proud to say that I get the opportunity to present to the general public, many different groups from school-aged children all the way up to retired um, scientists, and uh, it's really rewarding to be able to teach about this critical issue. Media interviews, student training is one of the, the most fun um, tasks, I guess you could say, that we have is working with students who are interested in this issue. And uh, I love seeing them graduate and then get really great uh, career opportunities following graduation. Lots of outreach to children at different types of fairs. Uh, we have collaboration with local, provincial, and federal governments. We have collabor collaboration with Indigenous communities. Um, we also collaborate with the uh, Chemistry, um, oh gosh, the Chemistry Association of Canada, the Plastics Division. And so that's really great that we have a relationship with them that is positive. And we also have a relationship with a not-for-profit pollution probe, which actually help to make policy. And so those two images, one is a sea bin. We're part of the sea bin project uh, with University of Toronto and Pollution Probe in which these sea bins are placed at marinas throughout the Great Lakes. And they trap uh, a lot of organic debris, but also plastic. And so that material is sent to us for analysis and characterization. And then um, what you see on the right is a lit trap one of my master's students is actually uh, has lit a traps um, installed in some stormwater drains in London. The city of London, who we collaborate with, had already had some of these, but we have now uh, sort of retrofitted them with a smaller mesh size to try and capture microplastics as well as the larger macroplastic items. Next slide. Right, so in terms of interdisciplinary science, I just put this on here because it looks very much like the, the medal that comes with the Felona Prize. And you will so, so, uh, soon learn about that. I think um, James is going to talk about it a bit, but in terms of the main sciences that I've collaborated with, um, I'm an earth scientist, obviously, but environmental science, chemistry, statistics, biology, uh, what's not here is, um, mathematics, but that's just starting. I have I have one uh, collaborator from the US who's a modeler and uh, hope to do more work with that person. Um, next. Great. But in addition to the different types of science, we also have um, art history, art historians, visual artists, photographers, geographers, uh, data visualizers, philosophers. Uh, next. And then we have not-for-profit organizations, the general public, and the government agencies. So all of these people are working together. Next. And finally, I put media here because without the media, 
um, I don't think that we would get our message across. And the media has been, you know, very kind to in searching for uh, scientists to actually give interviews and explain the work that they're doing. So it's, it's, I really think that they play a huge role when we're thinking about all of the different disciplines. We don't normally think of media relations, but that is really another important one. Next slide. Okay, and just to end off, I just wanted to say a few challenges of interdisciplinary research. One is identifying a leader. So your group actually needs a leader, even, even though many people could lead there's usually one person who needs to do the organizing and that can cause a little bit of trouble. Um, you need to recognize the key knowledge gaps and you need to harmonize your research methods and approaches, whether you are a chemist, a nurse scientist, an artist. Um, you have to establish trust amongst yourselves, develop a strategic plan, devote time for the startup because the startup always takes the most time of course, you have to acquire funding, which is often the biggest hurdle. Uh, you need to be humble and you have to recruit necessary stakeholders. Next slide. So recommendations for anyone who's interested in taking on some interdisciplinary research. These are some of the main things that I thought of. Um, accept that others will do things differently than the way you do. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I have asked a lot of questions of my visual arts colleagues when I have no idea what is up on the wall or in the exhibit, for example, the plastic heart exhibit, there were things that I had no idea what they were supposed to mean. So never think that a question you're asking is a bad question. Uh, leave your ego at the door. That is the biggest one, I would say. Uh, don't give up. I know people who have tried to reach out, artists who have tried to reach out to scientists and have gotten nowhere, but I would say don't give up. You know, if, if one doesn't work out, then keep trying. We all need to keep trying to find people that we can work well together with. Uh, I wrote, keep at it. Scientists tend to think they are the busiest people in the world. I mean, we are busy, but <laughs> everyone else is busy as well. And be open to shifts in thinking. And it takes at least two people that are really enthusiastic about the topic for this sort of collaboration to begin. And I think that's the last slide. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Oh, that was wonderful. That was wonderful, Patricia. Thanks so much. Uh, I think you did a great job putting the whole interdisciplinary uh, aspect into context for this. Uh, it was great. Thank you. And it must have been really hard to say no to that Hawaii trip, I got to say, I could imagine. <laughs> needing to say no to that. Um, so so uh, stay on stage here, uh, Patricia, and we'll take some questions. I think there are a few that have uh, queued up. Um, and we'll just take them maybe uh, from the top of the list. So do you feel working with artists help give a better platform to showcase these plastic conglomerates, like better pictures that allowed um, you to portray the issue to a broader audience? Yeah, I would say definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have them up on my shelf. I can see them right now. And that's probably where they would stay. As a scientist, uh, <laughs> I did my science. And now I, you know, I have them at, in my house and in my office. And it's really interesting because the artists have them in special cases. You know, like they're special things, whereas mine are just kind of sitting on, on the shelves. And so, it, it does show how, you know, we think differently in terms of what our aim is. Not, we have the same common goal, but the way we go about it is different. And so I do, you know, thoroughly believe that if I wasn't working with the artists, it would have never reached the proportions that it, that it has. Yeah, I mean, lots of people, when they kind of finish a project or finish a phase, you know, it does go up on that office shelf and you kind of carry on to the next one rather than pushing it out to the masses and letting people know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so how do you balance the visual impact of the kind of artistic aspect of the materials with storytelling to effectively communicate the environmental impact of the materials? 
Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I think what's really special about this interdisciplinary research is that many of the interviews we've been asked to do are joint and even many of the talks are joint so people are really interested in knowing how we got to where we are and how we continue to work together and so i like to think about that this talk we were invited to give at the smithsonian and the smithsonian has the art side with the general public sees but they also have all of those shelves and those big rooms in the back is where science is taking place and so like they already have that merger they have you know they put out what they know is going to affect change or cause an impact in somebody in the way they feel by looking at it but they also have to do the scientific work in the background and so that's kind of how i see it as scientists we're more background people the artists are more upfront people but the artists wouldn't have what they have without the science to back it up not that they couldn't do art without us i'm not at all saying that but if they're trying to convey a message it often helps if you have some scientific backup and for a scientist it helps to have someone who knows how to portray that and get um get sort of like the public to have emotion for the topic yeah so nice synergy really Mm -hmm. to have the science and the artists pushing it out there mm -hmm. um are there similar studies on consumer plastic waste in the environment and its distribution? And would you expect it to compare in a similar way as these pellets? Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I guess I chose to talk about the pellets just because it was related to the um, exhibition. But a lot of what we do is actually in that study of sampling 66 beaches, we picked up other plastic items, not just pellets. So we actually collected all of the consumer waste. A lot of it was things like straws, balloons, cigarette butts, um, shotgun shells, or I don't really know what they're called, but they're the plastic things that <laughs> I'm not a hunter. <laughs> you know, um, stir sticks, uh, syringes, um, tampons holders you know things like that and so yeah we definitely we we do collect we do um take note we we have also a publication it was just recently published um about all of that other debris that we're finding so you know for the pellet story a lot of it is in the hands of the producers um in stopping the pellets from going down the drains in the factories but it's also on the transporters and making sure that there are no spills because spills often happen. When it comes to the general public, they don't handle the pellets, really. I mean, you never see anyone just playing with plastic pellets. But, but in terms of the single use plastics, and I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, we play a huge role in that as well. We, we have, we're helping to, um, we're helping to develop policy for that type of thing. So now the uh, federal government has found six single use items that they are trying to ban, for example. And, and we have been involved. My research group is involved in talking, uh, going to meetings and having these, um, I forget what they're called, sort of like teas, but uh, workshops in which we try to figure out what are the main concerns. And so the pellets is just a tiny part of the, the bigger the bigger story. And like we are invited to participate in um, the Great Lakes Marine Debris Action Plan, which is written by NOAA in the United States. And there are only uh, you know, a few Canadians involved in that. So yeah, I think like the, the best contribution is, is in helping to develop policy in the end. I don't know if I answered the question or if I went on too long. But. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I think you absolutely did. I mean, you know, you made the point that this the plastic pollution spans all sorts of types and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you're tackling it with industry and ultimately with government. So this, I guess, leads to the last couple of questions. They're, they're, they're sort of linked in the sense that, you know, you've got the message out there really well that this is a huge problem. Uh, and, you know, do you think you've changed any practices in the chemical industry as a result of your work? And I guess as a 
bit of a follow-up to that. Do you see any alter, uh, alternate solutions uh, to the problems associated with plastic bags and styrofoam? So I guess this is about affecting change from yeah. all your work. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, in general, I would say that, uh, you know, Canada has made some strides in terms of uh, the microbead ban um, and uh, having different products. We're no, no longer able to produce or sell products that contain microbeads. So that's one. I do find some microbeads in my samples, um, but not a whole lot because I focus mainly on benthic sediment in lakes and rivers. Um, but we are working, as I mentioned with one of those slides, we are working with the, the plastics industry and with um, Pollution Probe in order to reduce the number of pellets that are actually escaping into the environment. So that's one way in which we're helping. Um, and then, also, of course, that goes back to the different workshops that we're doing with government in, in order to determine the worst, uh, the worst items that are being polluted are found along the shorelines. And, and also locally the, with the city of London, we're doing work there with them, with the litter traps to try and see what's going down into the stormwater drains. Great, thank you. Okay, so those are the uh, questions that were posted. So I'll just have one last ask if there's any burning question for Dr. Corcoran. Doesn't feel like a flaming question just burst onto my screen. Um, so I, I hope everybody has enjoyed hearing about the collaborative work, uh, sort of some of the collaborative work going on at uh, Western in Western Science. Uh, and I want to thank our students and Dr. Corcoran for presenting their work.